Afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Welcome to this seventh and last webinar of the Fly AI series organized by the High Level Group on Artificial Intelligence. I am Ignacio Vaca, Air Traffic Controller in Madrid ACC and Executive Vice President Technical of the International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers Associations, IFATCA. Jointly with Costas Christoforo, IFATCA Director Europe and an ADCEP Engineer in Nicosia ACC in Cyprus, we will moderate this webinar. Our panelists today will be Herbert Nassens and Rul Hurderman from Maastricht Upper Area Control Center, Andy Taylor from NATS, and Stuart Clark from Valpa. They will be properly introduced before their presentations. First of all, a few housekeeping details. You will see in your screen two buttons that allow you to interact during the presentation. Questions for the panelists can be asked using the Q&A button on your screen. You can ask questions anytime. As many as possible of them will be answered at the end of the webinar after all presentations. There is also a chat button that has we use only to tell us if something is not working properly. Please do not use the chat function to ask questions to the panelists. For that, use always the Q&A button. In the previous Fly AI webinars, the introduction of AI in aviation from many angles and expectations was covered. In this last webinar, we will focus on the human factor with a view to the process of implementation of AI systems in ATM. And Costas, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. During the recent years, we witnessed uh, how the new or maybe not so new concept of artificial intelligence in the form of specific applications is introduced and becomes part of our everyday life. It is implemented in a way that creates great expectations, but also uh, raises some doubts and concerns. Uh, there is definitely an issue of extra care in aviation being a safety critical environment. There are many applications, but the closest to aviation is perhaps the autonomous driving. Cars able to drive themselves have taken the road for the first time, but the first fatal accidents involving this kind of autom autonomous vehicles driven by software and not a human occur, immediately raising uh, eyebrows and questions about trusting the machine, the software, uh, and the role of the human on board. The, the same goes for the introduction of uh, AI in the aviation sector, where we should be extremely cautious with respect to safety critical application. It appears that two uh, potentially environments for AI application must consider the safety critical ones and non-safety critical. Of course, this is not new, but uh, we now have AI introduced in aviation through many research projects and is slowly becoming a reality. After the application of AI solutions, the human breadth and depth of knowledge in the same area will be depleted and will never be able to return to the previous levels. If safety is not clearly and comprehensively included by design from the early stages, especially for fatal modes uh, recovery, then public trust in this area will be harmed. And for sure, there will be many ways in which society will resist uh, their introduction. Uh, today, with our panelists, we are going to explore the change management and the need for reskilling and upskilling of the frontline actors, mainly ATCOS, ATSEP, and pilots, who are going to be face to face with these developments. So, without further ado, 
Let's move to our panelists. Allow me to present them to you. The, the first presentation will be related to the trajectory prediction. Uh, trajectory prediction is an essential component for air traffic management system capability, but is harmed by the by route uncertainty because of air traffic controller clearances during the tactical phase. By augmenting traditional trajectory prediction logic with machine learning, a considerable improvement to accuracy may be achieved. To elaborate on this important solution, we have today with us uh, Ru Udeman and Herbert Nassens. Uh, Ru holds a master degree in aerospace engineering from Delft University Technology. Uh, and he joined uh, Maastricht in 2003. At this time, the contract was uh, signed for the replacement of flight data processing system, and Ru was part of the core team that was responsible for the user requirements, validation, and implementation of this system. After the successful filtering end 2008, his responsibility shifted to the development and the end user representation of, of the traffic uh, management system, which was used as a prototype in several Cesar work packages. This later evolved into the integrated flow management position. Uh, the state of the art uh, flow management tool currently in use at uh, MUAC. Uh, Ru is currently head of operation capacity and responsible for the ATF CM and ASM domain within current operation, uh, covering the complete life cycle for uh, pre-tactical to post ops, as well the steering of the developments in this domain and the end user acceptance. Uh, now, Herbert Nansen is a team leader, architecture and system engineering, project manager uh, of traffic uh, prediction improvements at uh, Euron Control Maastricht Upper Air uh, Area Control Center. And uh, Herbert uh, graduated as a master's in science of mechatronic engineering at KU Leuven University. And uh, since 2003, he has been working at Eurocontrol uh, MUAC in various roles in the engineering division. Currently, he leads the architecture and system engineering team responsible for the overall technical design at the MUAC air traffic management system. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Kostas. Let me start by sharing the screen with you. Well, I hope that that works. Um, good. So, yeah, thank you, Kostas, once again. Um, my name is Rolf Jurman, and together with my colleague, Herbert Nasens, uh, we will be presenting to you uh, an AI application in our uh, ATFCM, so the Air Traffic Flow and Capacity Management uh, environment in, uh, in MUAC, uh, Maastricht Upper Area Control. Um, there was a first implementation a couple of years ago uh, that we will be talking about and sharing with you the user involvement and the user experiences from that uh, implementation. And we are also uh, working on a second implementation that is, in fact, widening the scope of the first one, uh, which is actually about to happen uh, happen now. And we will be sharing our, uh, let's say, user involvement and experiences so far in this uh, project with you as well. Um, but first, allow me to give you a little bit of, let's say, operational uh, of context. Um, MUAC is um, controlling the upper airspace, uh, that is flight levels 245 to 660, above the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and northwestern Germany, and a large part of the, uh, of the North Sea. It's an area of about 260,000 uh, square miles. Um, our airspace is divided, subdivided into 23 sectors, as you can tell from this, uh, from this picture. Those sectors can be combined into over 100 different patterns. You see a small um, illustration from one of our manuals uh, in, in, on the screen and now, how we can combine several different uh, um, sectors. Every 
block, every combination has a separate volume uh, from the network manager, so-called traffic volume associated with it. We're talking about uh, more than 52 different volumes, all of which need to be monitored by our uh, flow management staff. Maastricht is very dynamic in its sector opening and closing. Just as an illustration, you see at the bottom of the screen um, an output from our tool where every small block presents a 15 minute time interval and every different color is a different sectorization pattern. So you see that indeed we open sectors for as little as 15 minutes and even close them for as little as 15 or 13 minutes again, if the traffic demand so, uh, so allows or, or requires. So we are very much tailoring our sector opening and closing to the demand that the traffic poses. For every sector, we then on top of that have sustained and peak values for the monitoring of the amount of traffic in that sector. And those values can even be different for um, the cases where we have military activity in, uh, in our airspace. So I hope you would appreciate the, the let's say the, the puzzle that the monitoring of all of this, uh, of all of this is. So as um, Costas mentioned in the introduction, uh, several years ago, we uh, developed a, um, our own local flow management tool called the integrated FMP or the IFMP. You see a screenshot of it here. Um, the idea is that it combines whatever configuration that we have planned with the correct traffic volume to monitor so that there is no human, let's say, amalgamation of data required anymore. It is presented to you uh, in an integrated manner. You also see that the alarm lines, the, the traffic monitoring values, as they are called, are uh, presented correctly for each sector, even uh, drops in case of military activity. And you also see, because the idea is that this is a one screen that we use for monitoring all of the sectors that we have in Maastricht, uh, you see that the color setting is rather dull so that it really attracts very quickly the attention to potential problem areas shown in red here. There is also a, um, a, a synthetic flight prediction window. I hesitate, as you see, to call it radar window because it is not based on radar data. But in fact, this shows you what the radar window would look like in the given time that you are looking, 12 o'clock in this case, because of the red line that you see. And that there is a flight list below where we can actually have interaction on individual flight level, on uh, individual flight basis for uh, further details and for what they call cherry picking measures. So measures on very specific flights. Um, we are using basically um, sector occupancy prediction. So uh, Maastricht was one of the first to start using uh, occupancy, which basically tells you the amount of traffic that is in your sector instantaneously at every single minute. Um, and the way that we monitor that because of the tool and the fact that all of the relevant data is integrated into one coherent picture means that we can have very refined and dynamic capacity values for each sector, even varying them dependent on the time of the day, uh, on the fact whether there is military activity or not, as I already mentioned, or also in case of manual input, for example, when there is bad weather. All of this allows us to, I would say, drive our game very sharply, and it allows us to reach throughputs of over 100 flights per hour in, uh, in some of our sectors. I am talking pre-COVID traffic here, of course, as you will all appreciate. All of this makes us very dependent on having very accurate traffic predictions and very accurate uh, trajectory predictions also. Now, as many of you will appreciate and maybe have even experienced themselves, um, there is an inherent lack of predictability in, in, in the network traffic. Um, to start with, there is an average uh, at least for the Maastricht case, the average uncertainty in departure time is roughly 15 minutes, one five minutes. Um, there we could still argue once a flight is, uh, has taken off, of course, we got rid of this uncertainty, so that is corrected for. So there is a slight mitigation for that. Nonetheless, when you're looking further ahead, it is still a large source of uncertainty. But also, as Costas already mentioned in the uh, introduction for this um, presentation or for this webinar, um, actually the, construct, the, the instructions that are given in the tactical phase by upstream controllers um, that are altering the profile of the, uh, of the flight. On top of that, we see that the, 
military area reservations are let's call it somewhat volatile uh, which sometimes works to our advantage yeah? it means that we can have access to the area sooner than was originally planned which is a good thing but of course no one will have filed accordingly so that is also a source of unpredictability in the way that the aircraft will eventually fly and on top of that there is different airline policies for climbs and descents aircraft performance etc and we have found that all of this is very much driven by context and it is very difficult to capture this in a set of rules. So the first example, and this is the first implementation that we did a few years ago, um, was a very common case actually. You see here the route in the flight plan shown in orange and the actual flown route in, uh, in blue. It was largely dependent on uh, the activation or not of a military area right around here. But as you can see, depending on that activation, the flight is either following its flight plan, which takes it through our all no sectors, or it can be given a direct straight through the Luxembourg sectors. And in terms of prediction of sector load, that is a very relevant distinction. Now, supervisors and flow managers made mental corrections for that. So they would know that if the military are not active, ah, yeah, then I have to make sure that I mentally count the flights that are going through the Olno actually in the Luxembourg. So Luxembourg is underrepresented, Olno is overrepresented. I need to correct for this. That works, however, that gives increased workload for monitoring and for any measures that you would like to take. It causes count discrepancies with the NM systems, and it might be a wrong basis for regulations. So what we actually asked, our, uh, our, asked ourselves in this particular case, we know that in many cases, a direct is given 2.1, and in the follow-up, even a direct 2.2. Our question to our technical department was, is it possible to predict this, when this will happen? And is it possible maybe to learn from historic data in this case? Yep. So uh, when confronted with this question, uh, and okay, it was obvious that we could not write uh, a set of rules to, uh, to describe this. Uh, so we collected the database with uh, historical uh, predictions of, of flights that we had. Um, and we uh, would compare this to what actually happened. Uh, so the, the flown trajectory as uh, driven by the ATCO instructions. And this data spanning multiple years, uh, we have given to a, a machine learning algorithm that then learns the difference between a historic prediction and, and reality. Uh, and this is an, an augmentation model, you could call it. All this is, is done offline uh, because, of course, out of uh, safety uh, considerations, we cannot really do this in, in, in a running system. Now, the augmentation model, of course, is validated, and this is shipped into the uh, production system where it is applied on top of the new predictions uh, that are generated, uh, and this results in improved uh, traffic predictions. So what is important here? Uh, um, is it's actually blending two types of predictions uh, together. Well, if you could move to the next slide. Um, so on one hand, uh, we are using the existing rules uh, by, by which uh, trajectories are predicted. Uh, that's based on validated algorithms and, and model of known rules. Uh, and the advantage of this is that it can be updated prior to a change. And this is very important. For instance, we know that uh, there is, an, for instance, an NM summer initiative uh, affecting routes. Uh, maybe there is a change to an LOA. Now, that can be adapted up front. That's something that you cannot achieve with machine learning. So this is still the starting point. But then on top, we uh, apply this augmentation model. And that augmentation model um, from historic data understands the differences between the normal prediction and what typically happens in, in, in reality. So the deviations that are hard to model. And this is a reactive approach. And we combine the two, and that results then in, in better traffic predictions, as, as uh, shown in the next slide, going back to the example that uh, Rule was starting from. And so the orange line is, is, is the original flight plan, so the original prediction. Then uh, the blue line is what happened in reality. The red line is, is the prediction by the machine learning model. Huh? On the left, you see a case where there is no military area. So there is, it's 
obviously a very good prediction. If military areas become active, and that's you see on the right, uh, then um, you basically see that in the reality, the flight will still get a direct, so it will still deviate uh, from the filed flight plan, but at a different point uh, when it has just passed the military area. And, and this is also uh, predicted by the machine learning model. Now, this uh, mechanism that was applied on a subset of flows in New York. It was about 10% of all the traffic where we knew that those flights were really suffering from these inaccuracies in, in the traffic uh, predictions. Now, when we started measuring the, uh, the accuracy, it was clear that it was a, a very big improvement. Uh, uh, for instance, if we would look to how many flights uh, from how many flights is the prediction within six nautical miles everywhere from the uh, flown route, then with the original flight plan, that was only 10% of the flights. With the uh, machine learned trajectories, that was, that was already 65%. So it was an, an obvious improvement. However, that is purely from a technical perspective. Huh? So we had, of course, to convince the operational users that this is also better. Huh? And one of the, the things that we learned throughout the project is that uh, there is still a gap between, let's say, a technical improvement and, and something that is an, an improvement uh, to, the, to the user. And it is very important to correctly frame this to the operational user. Yeah. So. We were quite aware of that. So we made sure that we had extensive end user involvement in this. Uh, remember, we're now talking about the first implementation and this was actually one that was requested by ops themselves. Eh? They actually came to us and said, how can it be that we all know um, that this flight is going to fly direct because the military are not flying and yet the system keeps predicting him through the wrong sector. Can you not do something about this? And this is exactly what Havel just, uh, just explained. So it was a very, clear user case, I would say. So we also did extensive validations with ops in our test and training environment to show them, look, this is what you will be getting. Is that what you're looking for? And yes, they were happy. Yet, it was very difficult for ops to let go of the fact that they are now looking at a prediction that is no longer the flight plan. Um, so actually up to the point where they said, yes, but at all times we need access, we need to see the flight plan as well. We want to know what the system does. So we had to build in a switch where you could actually in the IFMP that I, uh, that I showed you, you could flip flop between the two predictions so that they could see what is the flight plan doing and what is the system telling me that is the, the most likely uh, route that they will be flying. Um, so yes, we had to build that in. Uh, we also made an extensive briefing package, and you see uh, um, a small folder here in the in, in the screen uh, as well, where we had a bit of a PR campaign also, and even a little bit of background knowledge of, of what are neural networks, in fact, and how do they work, uh, etc. Uh, it was quite uh, quite an extensive package that we had to provide, and it was more about let's say the whole data around it and the whole way of what we were doing than the, the real physical ops use case because that case they understood themselves they were asking for it to, uh, they were asking for it themselves but in the end we can say that that first implementation and again that's meanwhile three years ago was was very successful so um, motivated by this success we said well actually we should be extending this the scope of this of this machine learning to all flows in muac the problem that we ran into there is the fact that as soon as you start talking about more than the 10% flows that we were discussing uh, uh, so far, it is almost impossible to do an op a detailed ops validation. In, in the current package that we're talking about, we're talking about roughly 3,000 flows. So there is no way that you can have an operator sit behind the screen and go through the flows one by one to tell them, look, this is what uh, the prediction normally says. This is what the machine makes out of it. What do you think? Uh, it, it's impossible to do that. So. We had to resort to a way that we would just verify based on flow comparison of large number of flights, where we convinced ops to say, look, we looked at all data of the past year or even two years, 2 million flights, 3 million flights. Statistically, on average, this machine learned prediction is so much better. And these were tables like the one that uh, Herbert just showed you, so much better than the prediction that you have been working with so far. So we implemented that. However, what we improved was the geographical trajectory prediction. 
Now, OPS is not necessarily interested in the pure geographical prediction, but in the end, they're interested in sector counts. Remember that you're looking at how many flights are flying through my sector. So in the picture here, you see the uh, the, the orangey bit is the, the, the way that they normally file and the blue bit are the flown flights. And you can actually see that some of the blue flights are now crossing a sector, now here shown in red, uh, in this case, the, the Nikki sector that was previously not crossed and is not predicted to be crossed in the normal flight plan. Um, and in very many cases, controllers in such cases skip themselves because they know they're only skimming my, uh, my sector or a corner of, this, of my sector. Uh, we know of this traffic, we keep a bit of eye, uh, elbow combination, um, coordination, sorry, but I do not need this flight on my, uh, on my frequency. So I will not be in the sector sequence for this flight. And yet, when we implemented the improved geographical prediction, of course, all kinds of sectors were um, inserted into the sector sequence that OPS did not recognize. So there was a definite need for a second AI algorithm to fix this problem. Yeah, and that's what we developed. Uh, so an algorithm that would predict uh, under which conditions uh, ATCOs would uh, skip a flight from their sector. Um, of course, this comes on top on all the previous logic. So in the end, we have an integrated AI solution consisting of multiple components. So everything is starting from the uh, NM uh, flight uh, data, uh, so the ETFMS predictions. We use this, and this is the, the deterministic part that I uh, described, uh, we apply internal flow constraints and we come with prediction, predicted trajectories. And this is improved by an, an AI method. But then from these trajectories, we calculate sector counts. On one hand, we again have some deterministic rules that are knowledgeable about LOAs uh, and, and certain uh, procedures and, and so on. But also this aspect is augmented or improved by an AI algorithm. And in fact, we even implemented a third AI algorithm uh, together with colleagues from Eurocontrol Bretigny. We, um, uh, we developed a module that can um, yeah, predict when flights take off. So we, resulting also in, in, in big improvements. So the counts that are shown to the user, in fact, they are driven by three different AI algorithms in combination with, with some of the existing logic. That, of course, makes it uh, is a challenge then to, to start measuring the, the, the benefits of all this uh, because it gets quite complicated. Uh, and also because there are so many uh, flows involved, it's not that you could simply show a picture to somebody and, and, and have that person make a manual assessment. So we, uh, what we did is we, we have been running these algorithms in a kind of a shadow mode for multiple uh, days. And then we collected all the predictions and we created dashboards uh, that would allow uh, a user uh, to basically drill down in a particular flow, uh, for instance, between two specific airports, and would really show uh, how many of the sector sequences are matching, how much overcount do you have, how much undercount do you have. Uh, it also allows to see individual flights, even on the on the right uh, hand corner, the, the really the, the predicted trajectory of those flights to basically allow users to get a feeling what they can expect uh, with that method. So the human factors aspect of this, I already mentioned that the normal validation that we do where you can explain to ops say, look, remember this flow that we talked about, huh? when the militaries are not active, they go direct, that is now in the system. That was an easy briefing for the first implementation. Now, when you're talking of over 3000 flows, you can no longer do that. And moreover, there is also no clear use case anymore. Uh, there is a large number of predictors that are being used. So it's no longer only the military areas, whether they are active or not, because then it is easy to explain to ops. There is no for many flows, there is no primary predictor. Uh, the, the AI algorithm looks at many uh, uh, inputs. It looks at flight levels. It looks like um, it looks at uh, the upstream partners. It looks at the time. It looks at uh, yeah, very many different things. And from the historical data, it learns what is then for that combination of input the most likely trajectory. So you can no longer even explain to ops what exactly it is that we're what exactly it is that we're doing you can also no longer compare with another trajectory because yeah which trajectory would you be taking so 
it took us a lot of effort to convince Op to let go of this fact that, yeah, but I still want to see the original trajectory. No, the original trajectory is just the first input that we use to make a machine learned trajectory that is way better than what you are having. You should not be concerned about the original trajectory anymore. That is just the first shot. But it is extreme. it was extremely difficult for Ops to get to, yeah, basically to accept that. Uh, and we are talking about MUAC, where we are actually blessed with an ops room that is very much acceptant of change, and we, we make a lot of changes, so they are they are quite uh, uh, open to uh, to changes. But but even here, it took uh, quite a bit of time. And Herbert often jokingly said that the let's say the the, the work around it into convincing ops and creating the acceptance was as much work as was the technical uh, the technical implementation. The dashboard that uh, that was shown in the previous slide, where Herbert said people can look at individual flights, etc., that is only that is basically not something that is obviously used in the ops room. Eh? That this you almost need a PhD uh, to read the uh, to read the dashboard. So we have people that have that, and we have also people that in a support structure look at that and monitor the performance of our machine learning algorithm based on that dashboard. But to ops. Uh, we have really, we are reaching that point where, fortunately, due to the first implementation, huh, um, we have reached that trust level where Ops says, yes, we have seen what machine learning can do. Uh, we have seen that we should not concern ourselves anymore with what used to be the prediction. We are going with the new one. Uh, and yeah, we trust that this can also be done for all the other flows. So it does require high trust. Again, the stepped implementation helped. Uh, it was not a big bang thing. It was. It started off with a very clear use case that ops came up with themselves, and we solved for them. Uh, we had a very clear communication campaign, so a lot of PR, if you will, uh, around it. And of course, as always, there is a backup mechanism, but that is really a safety mechanism that we put in place that yeah, hopefully we will uh, we will never uh, never have to use. So, in conclusion. Artificial intelligence is very powerful, especially because it can model behavior that you cannot easily express in rules. It can learn from circumstances. It can take many things into account more than you could either put into rules, or if you, do, if you did, it would be an extremely extensive and difficult to maintain rule set, or things that maybe you're not even aware of that it made an, in, that it made an impact. So AI is very powerful there, but, the technical implementation is only part of the solution, as shown by the fact that we did increase the trajectory prediction accuracy, but in the end, it did not give, at least not in that first step, an operationally better solution. So technically better does not necessarily mean operationally better. The stepped approach, which we followed naturally, is, is I would say, almost required to build user confidence. You cannot, just like the example with, with the self-steering cars, you cannot expect anyone now to blindly step into a self-steering car and assume that they are fully able to let go and, 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 and trust. You need that trust building. And for that trust building, you need the end user involvement also in the developments and explain what you're doing, show them what the impact is and show what it means in terms of operational uh, impact and hopefully improvement. So end user involvement is key. That would be my, our main message here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Herbert and Ruhl for uh, this very interesting presentation. And uh, now we are going to switch to a different environment in air traffic control, the control tower. Uh, we are going to talk about a solution designed to enhance operations at low visibility weather. Uh, at Heathrow, that is the UK's busiest airport, every second counts when packing aircraft. NATS is using artificial intelligence in an innovative solution to help recover lost capacity caused by low cloud and reduced visibility. It's our pleasure to have today with us Andy Taylor, Chief Digital Solutions Officer at NATS to elaborate on this breakthrough solution with respect to the acceptance and the assistance it can provide to the frontline users, mainly tower controllers. Andy joined NATS as an air traffic controller in 1989, and with over 30 years of experience in the air traffic management industry, he has developed and delivered innovative ATM solutions for global customers to increase safety, airport capacity, and operational performance. Throughout his career, 
Andy has capitalized on emerging trends in the air traffic market and related technologies to maximize operational value to current and future customers. As Chief Solutions Officer, Andy works across both NATS and service technologies following the acquisition of a 50% stake in the market leader in digital tower solutions. He's responsible for the joint development of the partnership's digital tower capabilities and delivery models. Andy, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Ignacio. Uh, hopefully um, you can see my uh, slide pack. I was having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties uh, with the slides, but um, uh, I'll assume uh, that uh, there we are unless I hear otherwise. Um, so for anyone uh, not familiar with uh, London's uh, Heathrow Airport, uh, a dual runway operation, uh, multiple terminals and uh, delivered uh, from a, a traditional visual control room, uh, which uh, opened in 2007, uh, 87 meters above uh, the airfield itself. And um, one of the views that you can see here is, is a view direct from that cab uh, out towards uh, the newest terminal, Terminal 5. Um, and that's, uh, that's a direct view that the controllers um, see today. In terms of the use case, uh, this one's uh, slightly different, not only in terms of it being in the aerodrome control environment, but also uh, in terms of um, the fact that we're looking at uh, live analysis rather than um, predictive uh, usage. Uh, and basically the, the key that we've been focused on has been one of the constraints uh, on our operation, which is ICAO Viz2 conditions, uh, which we refer uh, locally as towering cloud when a portion of the uh, airfield uh, becomes invisible from uh, the visual control room um, and the controllers uh, adopt a uh, radar-based um, uh, operational uh, concept uh, where they uh, follow the progress of flights, particularly arriving aircraft on the runway uh, in order to determine that the aircraft is, uh, is clear of the runway. Um, and there are two critical uh, bases to that particular operation that the controllers are assessing, um, normally out of the window, but uh, in those reduced visibility conditions, uh, looking at uh, radar um, derived information. And that is basically the tail clearing the designated runway edge. So that's the painted um, surface uh, of the, uh, the runway uh, itself, uh, where our conditional landing clearance can be provided. Um, the tail is still uh, within uh, the protected area of the uh, runway safety strip, but um, the landing clearance can be issued uh, on the basis that the aircraft continues to uh, vacate the strip. So the second key part that the controller is looking to achieve visually or in uh, reduced conditions uh, using radar is that the tail then clears uh, the safety strip, um, which is shown by a uh, uh, a box around the runway um, on the ASM GCS radar map. You can actually see uh, it's, it's in fact um, the system that uh, has now been replaced, but uh, the, the latest system still operates on the same basis. And you have a similar uh, kind of, um, kind of uh, view in terms of, um, of it's all on a single screen, both runways and all the terminals. So the scale is somewhat smaller than when you're looking out of the visual uh, window itself. So the radar view also, as uh, anyone uh, that operates uh, radar uh, that's on this webinar will be aware, is, is clearly a uh, very slightly historic picture in terms of uh, the update rate. Ground surface radars being um, a much greater update, obviously, than airborne radar, but still a one second update. So therefore, um, not quite as uh, as quick as the direct view out of the window, uh, but nevertheless, uh, perfectly safe to operate. However, it does mean that following these procedures, we increase final approach spacing uh, to enable us to, um, to actually uh, clear the, the runway safely and uh, and to make make sure that um, that the the next flight can be handled safely. Um, this result results in a twenty percent loss of uh, arrival runway throughput. So clearly, uh, it's important uh, to uh, assist controllers in managing this situation. Uh, and technology is uh, is obviously the uh, the route that we are um, taking. 
We've been working with AI uh, in our operation um, since uh, 2018 and the establishment of a digital tower laboratory at Heathrow Airport at the base of the control tower, uh, enabling the controllers to work uh, directly with software engineers. But you can also see how during that period, um, our software models and AI models have improved uh, from our original uh, box and follow uh, type of models, which are, are typical um, used in, in the ATM industry at the moment, uh, as far as uh, AI um, image processing. And we've moved to the right hand um, object contour uh, model, which enables the aircraft to be wrapped and uh, gives us additional information, assists in orientation determination by the model, uh, which in terms of uh, the picture that you see, um, by wrapping the aircraft rather than it just simply being within a box, uh, means that as the aircraft rotates and makes the turn off the runway, the model is uh, able to determine that much more quickly and accurately, such that uh, error rates are significantly reduced and the performance is therefore improved. Um, those two images are being driven by the camera system that you can see, uh, part of a distributed digital tower um, camera system out near the runway, and that's uh, giving direct views to the airfield of the airfield direct um, into the uh, digital tower laboratory into Amy, the AI model, um, in order to carry out this uh, real time processing. So, uh, quite key, but it also means that uh, those cameras give the kind of views that you're seeing here. Uh, and in terms of working with the controllers, um, this is uh, where we're now um, moving to a picture of the laboratory itself. Uh, and indeed, uh, this is one of the Heathrow controllers um, uh, in the image uh, in the laboratory. So we're able to provide a live environment where the controllers uh, can look out of the window electronically, but they can also compare that to the AI output that they're be being given at the same time as us carrying out more statistical um, and uh, significant data capture in the background. So the two phases that we've actually had um, have basically been to establish this lab um, and to, uh, to uh, have the controllers uh, being able to come from the operation straight into the lab, become familiar with that and work directly with software engineers. The second phase is the one where we've focused on the use case uh, with the enhanced tower and cloud operations, uh, with AI model training and uh, real-time data collection and analysis. So over a period uh, in 2019, we actually collected 42,000 arriving flights passing uh, within the coverage of the cameras on 27 right, uh, the, the cameras that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, and that has given us um, both a view so far for the controllers to see directly and for them to work with us in terms of how they want uh, the output from, um, from the AI presented to them, but it's also given us the ability to confirm statistically what's um, uh, what's been achieved. So the AI models performed extremely well in all conditions, um, and basically uh, we can confirm particularly in terms of um, uh, meteorological uh, conditions, and then specifically aircraft type, size, and even paint schemes as to how the AI, AI model um, is, ma is managing to carry out analysis in real time uh, and at uh, multiple frames per second. So the software's performed well, and with um, hold line surveillance uh, system, as we call it, uh, fusing other data in, uh, the output has been extremely good to the extent that the intent now is to move to a next stage of, um, of validation uh, of the AI model, uh, a closed AI model, just as Rule was mentioning, uh, where it learns offline and then the model um, is uh, is adopted into the operation or in the lab laboratory initially to do the validation. But we're now focused on bringing the operation um, in when the visibility is at 550 meters uh, or potentially less and we're operating then um, in category two and three auto land conditions of low visibility procedures. So that would give us even greater areas where we can support the controllers in the operation and also uh, assist in reducing some of the operational impacts that we have to uh, the airport operation during those conditions. So this is effectively um, both the concept in terms of improving things through real-time analytics of video output views of the data to give us a faster, more accurate uh, picture for controllers. 
but not specifically for the controllers to see the picture from the, the video. Uh, that will actually be provided directly onto their computer screens. And in particular, as you're seeing on this, be direct onto their radar picture because when it has in cloud, the first thing the controllers do is adopt uh, a head down operation looking at AS and GCS. And it's important that when they're scanning that, they're also getting the feedback uh, from AI. However, the feedback from the AI also presents on uh, video output um, so that in a totally um, digital environment, perhaps the digital contingency, which is also a concept which is important to Hydro, uh, there is an opportunity for us to provide the AI support in all areas uh, that the controllers can scan. So this is somewhat uh, of a step change from our current scan of systems where you look out of the window and then down at systems where potentially you can look out of a digital window and also see um, a video uh, image and enhancements, including AI. So how does that benefit in terms of uh, human performance? Uh, well, we're seeing some real uh, clear benefits in terms of the overload uh, of controllers or underload of controllers, which I think actually is something that um, the last uh, 12 months or so have uh, have given a lot of us uh, cause for concern, um, where human performance can be affected by by that, particularly when controllers are used to working at uh, high rates of, uh, of traffic. Also, some of the benefits that AI can provide um, is being able to scan in 360 degrees simultaneously, which clearly uh, an individual air traffic controller cannot do. Um, so that can really benefit in terms of support. And I think this is another key um, in, in comparison to the initial discussion around autonomous driving. We're talking very much in terms of use cases and support for ATC operations and air traffic controllers. We're, we're considering the benefit of being able to add additional parameters to be balanced, reduce taxi time, wait time, airborne holding, that perhaps are factors that would be too much for humans to, uh, to consider, but machines can manage at the same time. So there's a number of areas where this can certainly support overall improving efficiency, helping the operational resilience uh, predictability in terms of um, that resilience, not necessarily in terms of predicting uh, what will happen uh, in this particular use case. But I think the key underlying all of this is that with that support, we see this as a benefit to enhance safety. Um, and it's uh, it's not a, 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 a course of the autonomous um, car for us. It's very much how can we improve our operation and support our operational staff. Thank you. Many thanks, Many uh, Andy, uh, for sharing with us uh, your uh, experience with this uh, clever solution. Uh, now, uh, for a short introduction on the topic and uh, answering to some of our questions, uh, I welcome today with us Captain Stuart Clark, Senior Advisor to Balpa Flight Safety Department. Uh, on behalf of the European Cockpit Association, ECA, and also uh, representing the pilot uh, community. Captain Stuart Clark attended Manchester University to study aeronautical engineering and was awarded a place on the Rolls-Royce Engineering Apprenticeship Program based in Derby. He subsequently trained to fly at the British uh, Airspace Flying College uh, Prestwick and eventually joined British Airways as a first officer on their A320 fleet based at London Heathrow. In 2005, he passed a command course on the A320 fleet and finally transferred as a captain onto the A380 fleet. Throughout his flying career, he served as a representative for the British Airline Pilots Association, holding various posts and sitting on several technical committees, including flight safety, air traffic services, aircraft design and operations, remotely pilot aircraft systems, occupational health and safety, and the environmental study group. He represents PALPA on the European Cockpit Association's Air Traffic Management and Airport Working Group, 
and he's also a member of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Captain Stewart, uh, an initial comment before I enter to the questions. Well, thanks, Costas. Uh, hope you can hear me uh, okay. Uh, yeah, just a, a brief introduction about the two organizations I'm representing. Uh, the European Cockpit Association represents uh, over 40,000 pilots from the National Pilot Associations of 36 different European states. And uh, the British Airline Pilots Association is a full member of the ECA and represents uh, 9,500 commercial aviators in the UK. Uh, the, in the UK, the members account for more than 85% of all the commercial pilots flying in the UK. Um, but BALPA members aren't just airline pilots, uh, as is sometimes thought, uh, represent all commercial aviators, uh, fixed wing and rotary, including uh, search and rescue pilots and crew and offshore helicopters, uh, police air services, uh, military contractors and training organizations. And uh, most recently and increasingly importantly, uh, we have members who are remotely piloted air system operators. So yes, we, uh, we also represent commercial drone operators as part of our remit. Uh, and we always like to say that we are the largest collective resource of commercial aviation qualifications and experience in the UK. Thank you, Captain Stewart. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is related to automation in the flight deck. Uh, the, the technical knowledge uh, and the recurrent training and the skilling. So my question goes like this. How are the pilots currently affected by artificial intelligence and automation in the flight deck? Please. Well, uh Pilots aren't currently affected directly by artificial intelligence in the flight deck itself, although there's a significant amount of automation of the individual tasks and uh, aircraft systems, for example, autopilot, auto thrust, auto land and uh, flight guidance, flight by wire systems, uh, flight envelope protections. Um, but it's fair to say that the automatics are supervised by the pilot. So the automation itself isn't in control. Um, from a pilot's point of view, the automation of individual tasks is a great idea because computers don't get bored of uh, repetitive tasks and uh, their attention doesn't wander if they're required to monitor particular system parameters for many hours on end. But on the other hand, we recognize that humans are fantastic at, at assessing complex situations and coming up with novel solutions for those based on their knowledge and experience. So. For this reason, the automation of entire work roles, such as uh, engineer or pilot or air traffic controller is, is more difficult. And, and interestingly, just recently, I was listening to a BBC radio program called Automation Nation, which was only a, a couple of weeks ago. And, and in that, there was an interesting quote that in the entire history of work, the only human role that has been completely eliminated by automation is that of elevator operator. Which, which I'm sure we probably many of stay in hotels recognize that that is definitely the truth. Um, but, but from the point of view of impact of automation on, on pilots directly, we'll know that over recent years, there's been quite a discussion about de-skilling of pilots due to the increased reliance on automation. Um, and as the complexity of flight deck systems increases, the, and yet the simulator training time stays the same. It's, it's inevitable that less time will be available to practice those basic flying skills. And we can't really have it both ways. So if pilots are required to use automation extensively during their day job and also demonstrate their ability to use the automation in the simulator, they won't have much exposure or time to practice hand flying. And like any skill, if you don't use it, you lose it. So the way I've been looking at it, the way we've been thinking about it is that it is after all, in the end, the basic skills which save us when the systems fail. And probably the ultimate example of this is the, the famous miracle on the Hudson when Captain Sullenberger hand flew his uh, aircraft with both engines failed to a safe landing on the Hudson River in New York. So. Perhaps our message is somewhat counterintuitive, but borne out by that, I think that increased automation brings with it a requirement 
for increased training time specifically for the practicing of basic skills. Thank you, Captain Stewart. Uh, my next question is related to the human in the loop. Uh, the, the, the rare uh, complex failures uh, of automation, uh, the start all of factors. So uh, you mentioned uh, that one of the significant problems uh, with uh, automation is the complexity of dealing with system failures. Why uh, you, you point out uh, this? Well, well, automation of individual tasks has certainly had a very positive safety benefit. Um, but as the level of automation increases, then so does the volume and complexity of the technical knowledge required, especially when you're dealing with system failures. And that, as you would expect, the vast majority of pilot simulator training deals with the handling of failures and problems such as engine failures, of onboard system failures, bad weather events and the like. When thinking about systems and automation, as a pilot, I'm not all that interested in how well the system works when it's fully operational, because that's the easy bit. You have to obviously understand those systems and how they integrate into the day-to-day -day operation. But what you really need to know is what happens when the system fails and how to deal with those failures. But we've now got to the stage where some systems are deemed so complex that they've not been able to be fully explained to pilots during the conversion training onto a new type of aeroplane. So perhaps the most extreme example of this might be the root cause behind the 737 MAX accidents. Um, when pilots have to deal with complex issues, they focus heavily on sharing of mental models. So put simply, we talk to each other in the flight deck with unambiguous language and use lots of open questions. For example, what do you think is happening? What do you intend to do next? How will you do that? But automation on the other hand doesn't share its thoughts and it's not possible to ask the system to find out what it's thinking or what it intends to do next. So on the one hand, system errors can be very subtle and extremely hard to spot until they're too late. But on the other hand, complex multiple failures can be sudden and catastrophic, causing the human operator to become instantly overloaded by a system that was apparently working until just a few seconds beforehand. And one thing we know for certain is that any system will eventually fail and often at exactly the wrong moment and in a complex and unpredictable manner. So one of the justifications that's been used for autonomous aircraft, and this is perhaps the same as autonomous cars, as you've already touched on, but specifically regarding aircraft, is there's a much misquoted statistic that's bandied about that says that 70 to 80 percent of aircraft accidents are due in some part to pilot error, human error. But the statistic is therefore then used to justify the rather simple minded premise that if you take the pilots out of the flight deck, you get rid of the majority of the aircraft accidents. But in data provided by Dr. John Holbrook of NASA to a recent flight safety seminar run by BALPA, over a 10 year period from 2007 to 2016, there were 310 aircraft accidents attributable to human error. And that was all civilian and military flying in the period. On the other hand, the data also shows that pilots are intervening to manage system malfunctions on 20% of all flights. So over that 10 year period of the study, there were approximately 244 million flights. So in other words, the pilots had to intervene against system malfunctions of one type or another on over 48 million flights. Um, and the question is, you know, how many of those system malfunctions might have resulted in accidents if uh, left uncorrected by human intervention, and we'll never know. So the takeaway message from, from us, I think, um, is not to use AI to take humans out of the loop, but instead it's probably safer and more cost-effective to develop automated systems which support and assist humans, and that will allow us to avoid the tiny minority of human errors 
but the human should retain overall control and management of the operation and overview of the systems. I, ho I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, and thank you, Costa, for these interesting questions and answers. Now we are going to the Q&A session of this uh, webinar. We have several questions that uh, have been asked in the Q&A uh, window. Remember that you can use the, the button of uh, Q&A to ask your questions to the panelists. And uh, to start, I think that I would go to a question that is very related to human factors, which is the the, what is this webinar is about. The question uh, runs, I find it very reassuring that ops wants to know what the machine does and have the ability to understand how it works. Could you say something of the age group of ops staff concerned? Were all age groups equally concerned with understanding what the AI does? I guess that probably Roar would be the proper person to, to answer this question. Yes, thank you. I'll give it a try. Uh, yeah, it's a very uh, good question, very interesting uh, question. Uh, like I said, first of all, in Maastricht, we are very fortunate to have a, uh, let's say, ops room that is very acceptant of, uh, of, of changes. So that's that's already a good basis to, uh, to, to start from. Um, the age pyramid uh, for our ops room is, is rather young. Um, so we have a rather young population and, and over recently, we are, we are starting to uh, uh, train new ab initio, so that brings the, the, the age even a, a bit more down. However, I would not say that it is age related. It, it is not as simple as saying, uh, yeah, the elderly people, including myself probably, um, um, are a bit wary of technical innovations and the new ones are immediately embracing it. That is, that is not the case. What we have found is that um, it is very important to explain to people what it is that the system is doing. Um, and, and that is actually more of an issue than than yeah the, the age of, uh, of 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 the certain people and some people are naturally a bit more involved in in or wanting to be a bit more involved in how a system works uh, than others um, but yeah that's a, that's that's a prime prime message here is make sure that people understand what the system is doing they don't need to become AI specialists uh, don't get me wrong um, but to just implement something and tell them trust trust us the system knows what it's doing forget it they need to know what's happening. Thank you, Ru. Uh, I think um, uh, it, it is uh, another question that uh, maybe Herbert uh, or you can uh, tell us a few things. Uh, it says that maybe you could even redesign the sector shapes and sector configuration based on the predicted flows instead of routes and uh, FPLs. Uh, then you not need to guess uh, the skips, etc. And the capacity monitoring values will be more accurate. Would you reply on this? Do you want me to give it a go, Hamas? Uh, yeah. 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 I saw the I saw the question indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I love the question, um, and of course it's spot on. Uh, and that is, in fact, exactly what we're doing. Uh, uh, of, of course, you could argue if, if the system is designed uh, optimally in all uh, respects, then you do not need the machine to tell you what or to guess what the system is doing because the system itself will tell you what it is doing. Um, so, yes, we are in the process of redesigning sector, uh, our sector shapes. By the way, you do not need AI to do this. You can simply look at the flow and traffic patterns. So we have a, a project in-house called Maserati. It's a long acronym for something starting with Maastricht, <laughs> um, where indeed that is exactly the aim, um, to redesign, to realign our sector boundaries uh, to the way that the aircraft are actually flying. Now, the first step that was made, by the way, and I did not mention that in our presentation yet, is the introduction of free route airspace, uh, which we did in December of 2018, if memory serves me well. Um, so there, of course, you have already the fact that the filing is way more closer to what they will be actually flying. And then indeed, the next step is to make sure that you have sector boundaries that are aligned such that you are adapting them more to how the, how the aircraft are, uh, are really flying and avoid a lot of small sector corner clippings and things like that. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Rui, for, uh, for your answer. Now I would like to have a question uh, that I think it applies to Andy or to her or both of you. And uh, it's, uh, there is a question about if is there a source with more details such as uh, data and AI algorithms of the models can be found? Perhaps because uh, well, some, some of the viewers want to know more about the, these systems. Uh, Hard, do you have a, an answer for that? Um, yes, so okay, there were uh, three algorithms uh, that uh, that we uh, described in the presentation. So the first one, uh, which is improving the trajectory. So the initial version there, there was a paper that is on, available on the Eurocontrol website. Now, to be honest, in the meantime, we have an, uh, an improved version of this that looks at more elements. Uh, there is not yet a, a paper for that one. Then the second algorithm, which was the prediction of the when articles will skip uh, sectors. Uh, since this is yeah being implemented as we speak, we did not yet want to to publish anything on this. But that will definitely follow. I mean, together with then the improved version on on the on the trajectory prediction. The third one, uh, so the algorithm developed by the colleagues in Eurocontrol Bretigny, uh, that uh, there is an, um, a paper of this in, in uh, the Elsevier Journal of uh, Air Traffic Management, I believe, in, in the August edition, uh, that is really digging in the details of, of that algorithm. Okay, thank you. And uh, Andy, do you have uh, some uh, more information that uh, can be found, uh, some more details about uh, this AI algorithms or uh, you know, that people can find more about, find out more about them? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I talked about two different uh, models uh, that we deployed in terms of um, the optical uh, uh, analysis. Um, we've also um, uh, carried out uh, voice recognition um, AI uh, modeling as well. So we use a, a number of different uh, models. Um, a, a lot of those are, uh, are either very available. The, the initial um, box and follow, for example, uh, is a very common uh, algorithm that's used um, by a lot of companies at the moment. Uh, in fact, you would find open source uh, stuff um, out on the, the web um, on that type of thing. What I would say is um, using the model to uh, the, the best effect and, and choosing the right model um, sometimes is a, a case of using experience or alternatively, it's a case of trial and error. Um, so it, it, uh, I, there's no certainty of it, but certainly in terms of having the right data to be able to uh, analyze and a good place to work on that. And that's certainly why we, we put the laboratory into Heathrow because of the availability of all the operational data and also then the ability to, um, to apply those models and apply them with the end users. Because I would agree with what um, has been said already in terms of the end users uh, seeing those models, understanding uh, when they are swapped for different ones and why we are adopting particular models. But at the same time, I would certainly agree in terms of the end users certainly don't need to become AI uh, specialists, um, no more so than they are computer um, programming specialists in terms of the systems we currently use that are hard programmed. But what it does do is give you much more flexibility in terms of having uh, algorithms that can cope with a much more varied um, uh, syst system that they may be, uh, may be analyzing. So I, I think that's where Roel was probably talking about the complexity of the sectors being somewhat more than, than, than just simply shaving corners off of them because the, the flows can be so variable. Likewise, in terms of the operation, um, the types and, uh, and the kind of visual conditions uh, that the optical systems uh, would, uh, would operate into. Thank you very much, Andy. Now I, I have um, an idea expressed in the Q&A session for uh, Captain Stewart. Uh, there is uh, a proposal why uh, we don't uh, uh, arrange in the cockpit as uh, we are moving through this uh, automation and uh, AI implementation to have uh, one pilot uh, which is going to act as a manager of the automation and will do all the troubleshooting analysis in case of something goes wrong. And the other pilot will be 
uh, proficient and uh, competent to drive the aircraft in the manual mode. Captain Stewart, what is your comment on that? It's, it's an interesting idea, um, but in actual fact, that's almost exactly what we do now, um, except that we don't dedicate one pilot to one role and one pilot to the other, but uh, there are two pilots in the flight deck for a, a number of reasons, and one of those is, as, as with other systems, uh, the pilots are, uh, are also uh, at risk of failing. Uh, so you want to have two pilots in the flight deck because if one of them becomes incapacitated, the other pilot can fly the aeroplane. Um, but in normal mode, in normal way of operation, uh, we have the roles divided up as pilot flying and pilot monitoring, we would call that. And the pilot fly, flying will be the one who will do the takeoff and the landing uh, and be responsible for the uh, controlling the direction of the aircraft and the other one will be the one who will handle system failures and, and system management. Uh, and, and, a lot, and in most airlines, those roles will uh, change from one pilot to the other, from captain to co-pilot. Uh, and that's also an extremely good way to share the tasks, build experience and uh, develop the next generation of, of captains. Uh, you can't suddenly take someone from being a brand new pilot and give them total control of a, a large uh, long haul aeroplane. So, you know, for the first 10 years of my flying career, I was a, a co-pilot and I learned um, sitting next to some incredibly experienced, knowledgeable and skilled captains. And then hopefully you try to absorb as much of that as possible. And when your chance comes to be the captain one day, you move to the other seat and you will have co-pilots with you. And, and so that process repeats. But Effectively, what I think that was Cesar who asked that question, and, and in, in essence, uh, Cesar is correct, but that's how we do it now. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, Andy wanted to add something to your point. Yes, thank you, Ignacio. I, I thought that was an interesting point uh, from Stuart. Uh, just in terms of obviously in air traffic control and particularly in the tower operation, um, we have very much separate roles. Uh, so you know each uh, each area of the airfield is is carved up and provide is given to a particular controller. Um, potentially, the use of of slightly different systems and intelligent systems uh, may mean that we could adopt different models of working. I'm not suggesting that that's the way that we're uh, progressing at present with the current use case that I described. However, it is an interesting one because at the moment controllers tend to work in isolation, uh, handing from one area to the, the next, from the runway to the, the ground, for example. Um, but actually having a team which is able to better support each other uh, and deal with, uh, with failures in a more joint kind of way like that of a flight deck um, by having sort of more of an overall monitoring uh, capability of the entire system, so the the airport tower operation, for example, that that's an interesting concept potentially. Um, so I, I, that's something I'd certainly like to take away from this um, discussion. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would have a, another question. That, yeah, I guess that it would be Herbert, the appropriate one to reply. That is, do you need to redo the AI training or validation process? with changes to the underlying network structure? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yes, the, the dashboard uh, uh, that I showed, it is fact, that's not a one-time activity and that needs to be done continuously, uh, not only because maybe the, um, yeah, the, 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 the environment changes, but maybe some even some patterns uh, in, in the way that users work is, is, is change. So you have to continuously measure this and, and check that what was validated before is still valid. In parallel, um, at some points, it's good to retrain uh, the algorithms with more recent data. But then you need to compare the, the newly trained model against the model that is already in the production system. And then you need to compare these results and then also back to reality. So yes, there is quite a lot of work involved in basically to maintain such a solution. And that's also why we are looking to try to, to automate this, uh, this, these continuous uh, measurement uh, activities. Thank you, Herbert. Um, I have a, a question that 
can be answered from any one of our panelists. Uh, is from Costa Simiakis. Uh, in an environment of machine learning, as human being will rely on, on machine's decision, how probable uh, is the pilot or ATCO will not be altered to correct a potential mistake of AI? In other words, is there any study in progress aiming at ensuring the vigilance of ATCO pilot and ATSEP? Yes, the case may be so that they may intervene timely in the decision of the computer is not the appropriate one. So what we uh, reply to this uh, serious question. Who wants to uh, give a try? I'm Costas. I'm happy to, uh, to to give my first uh, view on that one, which I think we've stated already. Um, the key in, I think, what uh, is happening in, in MUAC and also uh, in the Heathrow um, case study um, are not about extracting the controller from uh, the decision loop. And in actual fact, it's very much keeping them uh, in the middle of that. Uh, the supporting um, information that's provided by the AI uh, effectively is there to assist them in decision making. So in terms of failures and dealing with those, um, the level of, of the automation at present is very much a case of ensuring that the controller um, can see whether they have uh, output or no output from uh, the, the AI model or even a, um, an impacted uh, output and they're able to adjust their, um, their use of that and their reliance uh, to the extent that they do on, on current systems. So again, you know, in comparison, say LVPs, low visibility procedures, uh, in the past that may have been operated at, at major airports as only allowing, you know, one or two movements uh, at a time. Um, we can now operate multiple movements simultaneously by using uh, ground-based surveillance. So we are reliant on systems and programmed algorithms uh, but the controller is still very much in charge. And when those systems are um, operating uh, at below optimal, uh, they can, they can um, step in and, and take over. So my view is, is that the AI supports in that type of role. It's not an autom autonomous role where the controller is only there as a safety net. They are there as the, the controller. Thank you, Andy. Uh, anyone else uh, to compliment on this? Um, I think that very much applies to the MUAC uh, application as well. Eh? So one thing, and I see some various other questions that go a little bit in the direction of um, trustworthiness, accountability, even I see, uh, I see mentioned. Um, th the problem a little bit with AI is that indeed the results are unpredictable in some cases. Eh? So uh, for an algorithm, I can give any what if to, uh, to Herbert and he will tell me, okay, this is what the algorithm will tell you. For an AI, for a machine learning model, he said, well, yeah, that depends on how the machine interprets, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a certain degree of unpredictability uh, in there. Um, the likelihood that something strange will happen for all 3000 flows when we talk about our uh, application is, is not very great. Uh, and, and if so, it would probably be uh, incredible corruption, in which case we can we can switch it off. Eh? Remember the backout mechanism. Uh, but for the other uh, things, it is indeed, uh, so let's say small issues with flows here and there. That is exactly what this dashboard is meant to monitor. There is outlier detection and these type of things there. But for the rest, because the dashboard, you only see it afterwards. Yes, the worst thing that can happen is that you have a wrong prediction. But hey, it's not like the predictions that we had before we introduced AI were perfect. Eh? That was the whole point of introducing AI in the first place. And then there is enough safety nets in place with human in the loop to yeah, counteract any, uh, any effect. So a, a wrong prediction does not aut yeah, automatically lead to uh, uh, yeah, an incident, for sure not. There's enough. Uh, Swiss cheese layers in between before uh, before that would happen. Yeah. Yeah, we basically do not introduce new failure modes. Huh? And like Rule explains, okay, the predictions, they, they could have been wrong in the past as well. We replace them by predictions where we think that okay, statistically they are better. Um, but okay, to the user that, I mean, that's still the same type of failure cases. That's a very big step from 
from completely aut autonomy and where, where you would have, uh, like say, the, the example with the self-driving car. So I think maybe people see AI too much in, in that extreme and they do not see all the, the small things that it could improve, but that would not entirely take away the human. Thank you very much. I would like to you, first, to ask one of the questions here that is it touch a very interesting uh, subject. The question says, an AI system that keeps improving using the data it receives and processes needs to have accountability. Is it the vendor who sells the product or the user who uses and feeds it with data? And uh, I don't know, perhaps uh, Stuart, or perhaps if any of you want to elaborate. Stuart? Well, I I'm, I'm no lawyer, um, so I can't give a definitive answer, but I do know that, that this is a, a really growing area of, of law. Uh, and, and there are a lot of questions that we have really, because at the moment, the system is quite simple and obvious that uh, in the case of an aircraft accident, we know where to go uh, for uh, examining fault and uh, the commander's authority and responsibility is quite clear. Um, so if there are pilots in the flight deck, you know, they always say that the pilots are first to arrive uh, at the scene of an accident and you can examine the decisions they took and look at the training background and, um, and, and they can be held accountable uh, should that need to be the case. And the trouble with automation or AI systems and, and say the self-driving car scenario, which is the most extreme example or the autonomous aircraft is, where does that responsibility lie in the event of an accident? And there will be accidents. Of course, it's naive to think that we will eliminate all accidents, even in the far distant future. So, so where does that responsibility lie? Um, who is it ends up in extremis? Who is it ends up stood in court answering for the fatal accident inquiry? Is it the operator, the owner of the equipment, the airline, or the software engineers? Uh, who designed the, the machine learning algorithms. Or, and and I, I don't know. And I think that that's a, an entirely different strand of, of perhaps air law or, or consumer law. But those uh, issues are going to have to be addressed uh, because in aviation law, the, the role of the commander is, is, is enshrined in, in everything that we do, uh, responsibility and authority. And yet, there's no clear guidance about how that applies once you remove all the pilots from the flight deck. Um, so it's a big question, I think, that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Captain Stewart. Uh, a long line with this question, there is also a, a relevant one, saying that an important element of artificial intelligence, uh, trustworthiness, is to have a clear and an ambitious view on accountability. So this clear view, however, can be very ATCO, pilot, or ATSE polarized. How do you synchronize these views? Which is, I think, is a matter of uh, human uh, factors here. What do you answer on that? Captain Stewart, if you like to intervene. I, I think there are more questions than answers, and which is, it sounds like a cop-out from me, but but I, I think that um, we've got to, as well as the technological development that we're seeing at an incredible pace, these questions have also got to be answered at a similar pace. And it's not going to be easy to answer. Uh, we've, we've touched, we, we're almost just scratching the surface here of the issues that are arising. Uh, and we have to find solutions. There will be answers and solutions. But I think, you know, I would defer to an eminent lawyer on the subject uh, of, of all of these issues when you're talking about responsibility and accountability. Um, there was one other question that I think was allied to it, in fact, which came from uh, now, uh, Kesha Vashama, which, which asks how much it's possible to transfer operator expertise in handling system failures to automation through AI. And, and that's related, isn't it? But we could keep putting on layers and layers of supervisory AI over the top of the system. But, but if we take it as read that there will be failures, sooner or later, there needs to be an intervention point. And the problem with, so that using the example of the miracle on the Hudson, it was what you might call a black swan event where it was very difficult to foresee 
that that accident would happen at that time in that place? And how do you machine learn? Uh, how do you machine teach or, or get your AI algorithm to come up with such a novel solution, which Captain Sullenberger was able to come up with when his aircraft ingested birds into both engines, a double engine failure, and he's over New York at a certain height, and he's assessed that he can make a dead stick landing onto the Hudson River. And, and that event will never occur again, but similar events may occur in different places. And, and so consequently, it, how do you teach a system that level of innovative, um, skills-based uh, solution finding? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer to that. If, Thank if you very much. Um, oops, just, yeah, ahead, just, just one thought came to mind when Captain Stewart was mentioning that, yeah, this is an area that has to grow, yeah, basically, this, this expertise, this legal uh, um, aspects, etc. Uh, if you talk about human factors, and I, I very much try to stress the fact that it took a lot of effort in-house to, let's say, get people along with this change, that actually also included uh, our, our, our safety department and the safety assessments. So people have come to, uh, again, that example of an algorithm is very predictable in what it does for any what if feed that you give it. AI uh, model is not necessarily. Uh, and so it also took, let's say, convincing of the of our safety people to say, yeah, but in our case, the worst thing that can happen is that you end up with the wrong prediction. So as Herbert correctly pointed out, you're not introducing a new failure mode here. Uh, and of course, as Herbert also pointed out, in the Maastricht case here, we are talking about a, a system that is augmented by artificial intelligence and we, where AI is certainly not taking over or operating in an autonomous way. And I think that's a very, very important uh, uh, thing to realize as well, of course. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are running out of time. We have to still time for at least one question. And uh, it's a question for the first AI presentation panelists, so Ruhl and Herbert. Uh, is there an estimated probability of the need to resort to a backup mechanism when using this AI technique? Uh, the brief answer is no. <laughs> um, so, there, there are, let's say, uh, um, back out mechanisms in place. We, we can eat, uh, we, we can back out the whole predictions as such, and then we move back to the old, uh, to the old model. Uh, and of course, the question is, what would be the trigger for doing so? Uh, and it, have, it, it would have to be a, a massively going wrong in, in, in various flows. And even then, how would ops recognize that, especially given the COVID traffic that we're in now, where we're seeing traffic patterns that they're not used to. So again, uh, it is the dashboard that would tell us, but then only afterwards, that things are moving in a wrong direction for certain flows, but really on the tactical spot itself, um, no, the only thing that we have is uh, either back out the whole system or indeed being able to act on certain uh, specific flows to disable them from the machine learning. Um, but to be honest, I cannot think of a realistic use case where we would be able to pinpoint straight away which, uh, which flow to disable. Okay, thank you. We are running out of time. I think that uh, Andy wanted to point out something and then please Andy very quickly and then we go to the wrap up. Thank you. Yes, I, I'm just uh, really pointing out that, um, again, what we're not looking at is a total autonomous system. Uh, we're looking at specific support in specific use cases. Um, and by limiting that, the ability of the AI model is not stretched. So you're not looking at it being superhuman and, and um, stepping in, in in place of uh, a highly trained pilot or controller, like uh, the example of Sully on the Hudson. But likewise, we're also talking about closed models. So the AI is learned, we can validate it, test it in how it's performing and know what we're implementing. The models that we're currently deploying do not learn on the job. So in terms of it then going off and learning strange behaviors uh, and adopting strange behaviors, that is avoided in, in the way that we're um, training and uh, deploying models. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, while well, we are running out of time, uh, we have one minute. So it's time to wrap up and uh, have some ideas to take away from this webinar. 
And uh, one of them uh, would be that technically better doesn't mean necessarily operationally better. And user involvement is key. And a step approach and a clear communication campaign are key to success. The operator, uh, we have seen, needs to understand what the system does, what happens when the system fails, and how to deal with it. Another idea that we, it would be unfair to assume that the end user, in this case, the controllers, are systematically wary of change. In fact, uh, the trajectory prediction solution that we saw in the first presentation was requested by the users. And another idea to take away is that increased automation brings a requirement for increased training time to practice basic skills. And finally, as a final idea, rather than take the human out of the loop, it would be safer to develop systems to support and assist humans. So this concludes the last webinar of this series dedicated to AI. And I would like to thank all the panelists and all participants for their excellent presentations, the exciting Q&A sessions. And thank you to all the assistants to these webinars. And uh, finally, remember that if you want to review this webinar or any of the previous one, you can do it by surfing the net to www.eurocontrol.int slash fly AI, or simply just Google fly AI webinar. Thank you very much for your attention and your interest and uh, have a nice evening.